And I'm going to go quickly into some of these components of the system and how they differ a bit across each of the country. So you can see that this is divided between workers who fall under the labor law and domestic workers. And in the region, um, domestic workers are defined a bit differently depending on the country, but usually it's referring to domestic workers in the household. So that would be like maids, cooks, childcare, drivers, um, agricultural workers in some cases, etc. So what an NOC is, is a no objection certificate. And that means that you've got permission from your current employer to change your job. And so I've split this up into whether you need one, uh, whether you can change your job if you have a no objection certificate to transfer. The second col column is, can you transfer your job if you don't have permission from your employer? And then the same for domestic workers. Can they transfer if they have permission from their employers? And then can they transfer if they don't have permission from their employers? Uh, a lot of the ability to transfer without an NOC, which is the second column, um, a lot of these are relatively recent reforms. It used to be very difficult to transfer employment even after you've completed your contract. But now there are a few provisions that allow workers to change their job without permission from their employers. So I'll go through a couple of examples. So for example, in the UAE, when you've completed your contract, you can change your employer without permission from your original employer. Alternatively, if you haven't completed your contract, but your employer has caused um, you know, certain wrongs against you, has violated the contract, has not paid you for about 60 days, then you can basically file a complaint, which would allow you to transfer your employer without their permission. Saudi is quite similar as well. If you can prove non-payment for three months, Kuwait, if there's a complaint against an employer. Alternatively, if you've completed three years with your employer in Oman if you've completed two years of service in Bahrain if you've um, you know completed one year of your contract but you've still got to notify your employer even if you don't need to necessarily get their permission. Qatar is the most interesting one because there's been some promises made and again some really good PR um, which has stated that they've cancelled the no objection certificate that they've you know, made it much easier to transfer employers. But in practice, the permission from the sponsor is still needed to, to change jobs. One thing I would like to highlight here, though, is you'll notice that a lot of the countries say, if you can prove something against your employer, you can change your job. In reality, it can often be very difficult to prove anything against an employer. And the process of obtaining that proof or, or proving it to a court of law can also be very difficult. Most of the countries do permit transfer without any conditions if the sponsor does approve. The only exception is the UAE in Kuwait, uh, where the UAE, you should, you should work with your employer for six months. And in Kuwait, you must work for a year or pay a fee. Now for domestic workers, it is a bit different. There tends to be a few more restrictions, but you'll also notice that a lot of the tables are left blank. And that's because there's just a lot of ambiguity in the law. And with domestic workers in particular, they're really vulnerable to these gaps because the enforcement of these laws is really just up to well, one, whether they can even get outside of the house and attempt to find another employer and attempt to you know, lodge a complaint against their existing employer. And two, it's kind of just up to whatever administrative official is there at the time. Just quickly, we'll go over a few of the recent reforms that have been made to the system. So there's been a lot of tinkering over the past you know, 10, 15 years of the system. And the majority of this tinkering has just made it a little bit easier for workers to transfer, um, to transfer employers uh, without permission. Again, I'll just highlight a few of these. So for example, in 2017, um, Saudi for the first time made it possible for domestic workers to transfer employers without their sponsor's permission if some forms of grievous abuse were approved. In 2016, Kuwait allowed for workers to transfer employers without consent after three years of work, notably excluding domestic workers. Oman's is really interesting. So last year, they uh, announced a decree uh, in which employers who lodge an absconding charge against migrants have to provide proof that they've done so. And that proof can be in the, is in the form of showing that they have paid the worker for three months. And so this protects a worker who has left an employment situation because they haven't been paid. So what often happens is that, you know, when a worker files a complaint, against their employer, their employer will file an absconding charge against them, kind of a counter complaint. And in some of the Gulf countries, they've kind of wisened up to this so that if a, an employee has already lodged a charge against an, an employer, the system will kind of note that.
it'll be taken into account if the if the employer then follows a counter charge. And so what Oman is doing is essentially trying to protect against some of the common abuses that is being used with absconding. Again, this also does not apply to domestic workers. Bahrain is the last one I'll discuss because it's been getting a lot of news lately, which is the, the flex permit. And some people have taken this to mean that, you know, all migrant workers in Bahrain can now sponsor themselves. So this isn't true. The flexi permit is a limited, uh, a limited scheme which allows some irregular workers to sponsor themselves by paying quite a large fee to the labor market authority in Bahrain. We haven't seen that too many migrants have actually gone for the flexi permit because it's very expensive for the types of workers that would kind of need to be under the flex department, the types of workers who've become a regular because of their employment situation. Um, the fees are extremely high and very difficult to sustain. Um, Bahrain did extend this to include some domestic workers last year as well, but it's not clear how many domestic workers are actually taking part in the system. The flex department is a really good example when you see a lot of media or PR about a reform. The flex department got Bahrain a lot of accolades and yet you know, if we look at it like a year and a half later, it's really, it's really not done as much as it's promised and it really wasn't set up to do that. So you'll notice that reforms that are implemented are always going to be something that is eventually in the favor of the state. They're not rights-based reforms. Flexi permit, for instance, was a revenue model for the Bahrain government. That's how it turned out. So the reforms either are made in such a way that the employer, individual employer benefits or the state benefits in terms of revenue. Um, so that's something that we need to keep in mind when these announcements are made, including in the case of Qatar, where Qatar is getting a lot of good PR of late saying that they've abolished kafala. It's important to then look into what aspects of it that they're talking about and how it has an impact on the ground. I'll just go briefly over what some of the prospects of reform are. So as I've said, you know, over the past decade or so, there's been a sort of gradual tinkering of the system rather than an overhaul of the system. Certainly not an abolishment of the system, though at least three of the Gulf states have claimed they've abolished it. And I think we're likely going to be seeing this continuing tinkering over the next few years. You're going to see, you know, regulations that are relaxed. I think it's difficult to imagine the migration system really moving away from this individual sponsor system anytime soon. We have seen that some of the regulations have become much more relaxed for very high income expatriates. There are some models of self-sponsorship for expatriates who own a lot of land, for example. These are very, very limited initiatives. And as we've seen, you know, existing reforms have largely excluded domestic workers or kind of included them as an afterthought. And we're probably still going to continue to see this trend. There is one movement that is kind of happening around the Gulf, which is starting to sort of chisel away at individual sponsorship, but not quite. And this is the recruitment of workers through public-private partnerships. So the UAE, Saudi, and Kuwait have started these. They're still all kind of in their initial phases. And what the UAE at least offers, for example, is the ability for the, the company itself to be the sponsor of the worker. And then the domestic worker is then sort of hired out by, by individuals. So the company is the one who has the responsibility for the worker uh, rather than the individual. But again, this is just one aspect of the reform. Individual sponsorship of domestic workers is still permitted. And there's been a lot of hiccups with these public-private partnerships. They've been very slow to be implemented. They've not necessarily been accepted by people right away. So it's unclear really if if they are going to work out going forward, then again, they would only apply to domestic workers. And I think one key thing to mention is that even if the kafala system were abolished, it would not resolve all of the issues that workers face. So the kafala definitely compounds the exploitation of workers and makes it extremely difficult to get out of an exploitive situation. But that exploitation is the product of so many intersecting things. It's the product of recruitment. It's the product of, you know, the social power that locals have over workers, the exclusion of the court systems of workers who don't speak Arabic, for example. There are so many things. So I think one, you know, really critical thing 
for us to think of in our advocacy is to kind of go beyond this, you know, abolish the kafala system. Even if that is the end goal, I think kind of just taking a step back and thinking through what are the most, you know, egregious aspects of the system that can be reformed and what else needs to be changed in order to protect workers' rights. And uh, I think the important thing for us when we're doing advocacy is probably to stop using the term kafala as much because it's a fig leaf, right? So you say this is the kafala and one of the countries will say, no, what you're talking about is not our kafala. So it's become a very easy term for advocates to use, be it trade unions or international NGOs whose main reports say abolish the kafala. And that has actually given Gulf countries a kind of a screen that they can hide behind. Really, uh, what we would advise is not to use the term kafala, but talk about specifics within kafala that are problematic. So if your work involves advocating in Saudi, then talk about the specific, talk about what that employment relationship between the domestic worker and the uh, national is. Or if you're talking about construction work, talk about the inability to change jobs, the access to justice. So talk about specific issues as you would in any other place. We understand like talking to colleagues in Singapore, the Singapore immigration, especially for domestic workers, the the employment terms is very similar to kafala, but nobody uses the term kafala for Singapore, right? They still use specific, I mean, they're referring to specific provisions that are problematic. So I think that's really important for us to understand. And this is something we struggle with as well when we are in interregional dialogues or discussions. And then we hear people talk about the kafala uh, and say this has to be abolished without really understanding it. Then we see why advocacy fails because you're not talking about specific issues. So using it as an umbrella term for all exploitative practices should probably stop because some of those exploitative practices are not just the immigration policies. It is a labor law itself. It's the implementation of the labor law. And these two are separate things. And that's what we need to look at. Rima mentioned flexi permit. And as we said, it was supposed to be a revenue model for Bahrain more than anything else. What the flexi permit did was you sponsor yourself to work as a freelancer. But then who takes responsibility? It is still not clear. They haven't given an acceptable enough response on whether the labor law applies to those workers who use the flexi permit. At the end of the day, you're there to work. And if the labor law doesn't cover you, whoever your sponsor is, whether it's you or someone else, then the kafala continues to exist. Because the person you're working for as a freelancer still has power over you. And at this point, they can't even be held accountable because you're a freelancer. So, which is why it's really careful to like analyze these new reforms and kind of map the impact it has on that individual. It is supposed to benefit because when you look at it, then you realize that it's not the individual worker who's benefiting. One of the other things that we want to talk about, we have a report and we can share that with you later, is you might often hear of amnesties. Amnesties as a way of allowing irregular workers to either leave the country without penalties, without paying fines, or amnesties as a way for them to regularize their status. Now, which is a good thing if it were just these two reasons, and the reason that the worker becomes unemployed or irregular is their own, because of their own actions. But nine out of 10 times, it isn't. It's because the employer, the sponsor, has failed in their duties. And the amnesties don't hold them responsible. There are no penalties against employers who force workers into irregularity and don't pay them. And then governments announce amnesties and force them to leave the country. So again, when amnesties come out, it's a good time to use that as an advocacy platform. Use that to pivot your advocacy efforts around. The other question that came up was about bilateral agreements. And I want to say that In our experience, we haven't seen very many good bilateral agreements. Philippines is an exception. They do have fairly good terms, but most of the other countries and what Gulf countries do is 
the minute a group of countries push back and say we want better terms, instead of negotiating with them and seeing how they can come to a mutually beneficial agreement, they go look for another source country that is desperate for employment, desperate for remittance, and they tap into that market, which is why reform has been so slow because there are enough countries around the world that are desperate to send their citizens abroad. So now if the Asian countries are pushing back, if Sri Lanka and Nepal and Bangladesh are saying, okay, we need our workers to be treated better, the first response is not, okay, let's sit down on the drawing table and rework the negotiations. The first response is, let's go to another country. Let's go, go to East Africa or West Africa and find countries that are really desperate to send their women. So this is why bilateral agreements, I know there is a value in having those negotiations between two countries, but nothing on the ground will change if the labor law and the systems within receiving countries don't change. Because bilateral agreements will, again, only protect some of the rights of certain nationalities. It's not protecting all of the rights of all of the workers. So important to keep in mind about that as well. Uh, just one thing to add to that quickly as well. The question was phrased as bilateral cooperation. That term, I think, is a really key distinction from a bilateral agreement because I think we see a ton of bilateral agreements, but you don't really see cooperation in terms of the enforcement of those agreements. So even as Vani said, you know, the Philippines model is probably the best bilateral agreements that currently exist. But even there, you see the Philippines embassy uh, greatly broadening their scope of protection. It's them who are really enforcing the bilateral agreements within these countries. It's not the GCC countries which are going above and beyond to make sure that Filipino workers are enjoying the standard that they have agreed upon. So I think that is also really key.